Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Madeline Milka, President and CEO of APEX, the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. Thank you to Running Start for having us join them today and co-hosting this wonderful dialogue that we're about to have. To give you more information about APEX, our mission is to promote API participation and representation at all levels of the political process, from community service to elected office. When I started my tenure as president and CEO, I saw that the AAPI community didn't have enough AAPI women running for office. There are only 47 AAPI women state legislators out of over 7,300 plus seats, and yet there are three AAPI women in the United States Senate, the most exclusive club in the world. Running Start and APEX center our work around bringing our communities together to share, to inspire, and to take bold action towards creating a more representative democracy. I was elected president of my high school student body and vice president of my student body in college in the early 90s. I was very fortunate to have served at Tulane University with an elected executive board comprised of all women from different ethnicities, geographical parts of the country, and with a variety of majors. Our diversity is what makes this country so spectacular and how we reflect that diversity in our elected representatives is how we can truly be a democracy for the people. I'm most pleased about APEX's work with the Women's Collective. This signature program was designed to bring AAPI women together to uplift our stories and to encourage one another to take that leap of faith and run. Our annual summit is on July 30th, so please visit apex.org to register or to learn more of our youth leadership programs. With changing demographics, society is poised to see a shift in how we see ourselves represented as Americans. As women, we all have stories to share about overcoming challenges and advocating for public policy that benefits all of our communities. APEX is here to serve as a resource. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. And I'd like to introduce Susanna. Thank you so much, Madeline. So I'm the president and CEO of Running Start, and I'm so proud to be here today um, in partnership with APAX to put on this wonderful panel. Um, Running Start, if you're not familiar with it, we train young women to run for political office, and we focus on very young women, so high school and college age, with the idea that if we give young women the confidence, the capabilities, and the connections that they need to feel like leaders and to feel confident as leaders, um, then they will rise to leadership. And having a more diverse group of people in politics is going to change everything. So when um, we first started, we're now 14 years old, we had a very small percentage of um, AAPI women in our programs. And I want to thank Sharon Yuan and the Asia Group because it was through the Asia Group that they gave us money for a scholarship specific for AAPI women. And so over the past, I think it's been six years, we've been in partnership with them. We have seen our numbers of AAPI women grow dramatically. Um, in fact, I think that we're, we're probably double what the national average is in our program. So um, we are really pleased to be um, supporting this panel today and um, to have Sharon Yuan uh, as our moderator. And I'm going to introduce Sharon very briefly uh, because um, I won't have a chance to do it later. So Sharon Yuan has worked in the White House. She was in the um, the National Economic Council, and then she worked in the Department of the Treasury before becoming the managing uh, partner and general counsel at the Asia Group. Um, so welcome, Sharon. We're very excited to have you as the moderator. And before we start the panel, we have two special guests to introduce you to. Um, so first, Tasha Cole is Running Start's Democratic Board Chair, and we're so happy to have her on the call today so that she can tell you a little bit about her commitment to Running Start and work with Running Start, and she can introduce Congresswoman Judy Chu, who we are so thrilled to have uh, with us today. So Tasha, take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you. All right. You all can't hear me. Can you hear me now? My apologies, my mute went off. Okay, we'll do it again. Uh, this is Tasha Cole. I wanna thank Susanna uh, for the lovely introduction and wanna thank Madeline for being a part of this and everyone who is a part of the conversation today. We're so excited. I'm excited to join 
uh, be part of this conversation. Um, I was on a panel yesterday and shared that the value of women in the workplace and in politics and in our, in our communities is our commitment in creating and demanding uh, a culture of learning and our unique competitive advantage in relationship building and sustainability is why I really am so honored and happy to be connected with Running Start. Uh, we can't take for granted that despite many of us receiving the best education in the postgraduate education, most of us, unless you studied political science or history, your curriculum did not include courses on systemic racism, allyship, uh, race, privilege, or justice. So convening these kinds of conversation is so critically important. And it's with that, I am so honored to introduce uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu. Uh, in my day job, I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So I have the privilege to see the work that she is doing every day on behalf of candidates, on behalf of members of Congress, on behalf of her community. And it's an honor to share more about her uh, she was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in July 2009. She represents the 27th Congressional District, which includes Pasadena and the West San Gabriel Valley of Southern California. Representative Chu currently serves on the powerful House Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over legislation pertaining to taxes, revenues, Social Security, and Medicare. In that committee, Representative Chu is a member of the subcommittees on health, giving her oversight over healthcare reform and crucial safety net programs, worker and family support and oversight. She also serves on the House Small Business Committee, which has oversight over the Small Business Administration and is the chair of the Small Business Oversight Subcommittee. So she's doing great work for us in Congress. In 2009, she became the first Chinese American woman elected to Congress in history. Please welcome Congresswoman Judy Chu as she gives us opening remarks. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Running Start, the Asia Group, and APEX for hosting today's incredibly important panel on the opportunities and barriers facing AAPI women in politics. I'm particularly pleased to see conversations like this because as a young girl myself, I never actually thought I would be in elected office, let alone a member of Congress. It's because in those days, I never saw anyone like me in such positions. So it never even occurred to me that it was a possibility. But these days, that is changing dramatically. Women have started organizing and marching in numbers we've never seen before. And in 2018, women were more inspired than ever to take that next step. And so many chose to run for Congress. Today, thanks to their hard work, we have 130 elected women in Congress, the highest number in history. And as chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, or what we call KPAC, I'm especially proud that we now have a record number of Asian Pacific Islander members of Congress. It is 20, which is our highest number ever. And so many of our KPAC women members our historic first for our community and for our country. In fact, one of the founding members of KPAC, Patsy Mink, was actually the first woman of color ever elected to Congress. And she did so much in that position. She was a fierce champion for women's rights and authored the landmark Title IX law that prohibits sex discrimination in education. And we've seen the results of her legacy in the AAPI women who've been elected since to Congress. We have Stephanie Murphy, the first Vietnamese American woman to serve in Congress. Pramila Jayapal, the first South Asian woman elected to the House of Representatives. We have Tulsi Gabbard, the first Samoan American and first Hindu ever elected to Congress. And Grace Meng, the first Asian American ever elected from New York. And in the US Senate, it is truly amazing. We have not one, not two, but three Asian American women in the US Senate, Maisie Hornell, Tammy Duckworth, and Kamala Harris. But I'm looking to the future. I'm looking to women like you 
And I want to encourage each of you to continue following your dreams. And I want you to know that you can break through the barriers that others may have placed in your way. For me, the change that made me run for office was when something terrible happened in the city I was living in, Monterey Park in California. The city was changing because immigrants were moving in the city and an anti-immigrant backlash occurred. There was a loud group of longtime residents that resented the new immigrants. They wanted English only on the signs in the city and only English books in the library. The last straw was when there was a resolution passed by the city council saying that only English should be spoken in the city. Well, when the English only resolution passed, people said enough is enough. It became apparent that the makeup of the city council did not reflect the people who lived in it. So I ran for the council to be a new voice, a voice that would work to bring the community together. I won that election and spent the next 13 years on the council working to bring a more inclusive city forward. And I served as mayor three times. Then a vacancy occurred for the state assembly seat in my district. But when I decided to run, I was quickly blocked by the old boys network that was in power. You see the establishment chose their candidate, certainly wasn't me, because of their powerful backing, the speaker of the assembly did, did not support me either. So things looked pretty bleak. But then there was a turning point in my campaign and I remember it well. It was the moment that a mentor came to help me. It was then Congresswoman Hilda Solis who decided to support me. You see, she had gone against the old boys network herself. When she ran for Congress, it was against an entrenched longtime incumbent, a male incumbent, of course. She faced many naysayers in her campaign, but she persevered and she never forgot what it was like to go against the old boys network. So in one of the most memorable campaigns in LA history, she did win. She gave this, me the support that I needed in order to gain my momentum. I won that state assembly seat and the experience taught me an incredibly important lesson. Find a mentor, find someone who believes in you and will help you. I found one with Hilda Solis and it made all the difference in the world. When women support each other, we can succeed in making real change. So I say to each of you, keep it up. You are capable of doing more than you may have ever imagined for yourself. I never imagined running for office or that I would be in Congress, but when the opportunity came, I made sure I was ready. And in 2009, the congressional seat did open up. I ran, I won that election, but was really the amazing the next day after my victory because President Obama called me from the White House to congratulate me on becoming the first Chinese American woman ever elected to Congress in history. So you never know where that road will lead you. I want to encourage all of you to continue to learn and dream and to follow exciting opportunities when they present themselves because I know that you can do anything that you put your mind to. So thank you for your passion and your hard work. Know that your voices matter and we are counting on you to use them. Together, let's make sure that AAPI women are represented at all levels of government. Let's make sure that all AAPI women reach for the skies. Congresswoman Chu, thank you so much for your remarks, um, you know, and, and for your leadership and, and all of your service. Um, it, it really is, you know, wonderful to hear about the strides um, that are being made uh, in Congress in terms of uh, representation. And we look forward to, to being able to see you uh, continue to do wonderful things going forward. Um, I know you are quite busy uh, and especially as as Congress tries to wrap up before the um, the August holiday, <laughs> yes. but so thank you very much for for taking the time uh, again. Um, really appreciate it, and um, we hope that uh, we'll see you again um, in future events. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, you know, with that, um, you know, I have to say, um, you know, we are we're very fortunate today. In addition to having Congresswoman Chu uh, participating, we um, have a wonderful group of panelists. We've got four remarkable women uh, from different backgrounds and different experiences that uh, we're hoping to explore with them a little bit today about um, you know the topic of this panel uh, or of this session, which is really about. Um, you know, the opportunities and barriers that Asian American uh, women face um, in, in the pursuit of uh, leadership, not just political, um, as, uh, as Congresswoman Chu talked about, but also the power of mentorship and community engagement within the AAPI community in particular. So, um, you know, what I thought would be useful and, and what um, Running Start and others have asked uh, me to do is to maybe set the table a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go too far down the historical path because, um, you know, we we, while we've made strides, um, there's really quite a bit of work to do. And so you don't have to go too far in, in the data and the statistic to, to see that um, we still face you know, substantial challenges um, and obstacles um, uh, now. So there was a, a Forbes article earlier this year that you know, provided some really interesting statistics. And you know, what struck me first and foremost is they had a, um, uh, a, um, a, a young woman, um, younger than me, but nonetheless, who was talking about the challenges that she faces an Asian American woman um, in the uh, insurance sector. Um, and you know, and, and in particular, how um, Asian Americans are the forgotten minority um, as it relates to the glass ceiling conversation. And of course, not only do we face the unique challenge of um, potential racial bias, but gender bias as well. And so, you know, what has been essentially framed as this double pan glass ceiling. And so, just I thought, you know, some statistics um, would be useful. I mean, in Silicon Valley, Asian Americans are the largest uh, cohort, about 47% of entry level non managerial employees with a college degree or higher. So they're professionals, but they're only half as likely as white men and white women to hold positions within two reporting levels of the CEO. So, essentially, an executive. In law, which is you know where I spent um, uh, more years than I like to admit, Asian women outnumber Asian men among associates um, at U.S. law firms. But Asian men are almost twice as likely as Asian women to become partners, 64% compared to 36. And in corporate America, even though Asian American women are the demographic group most likely to have graduate degrees, they are the least likely to hold positions within um, an executive level position or have um, a line or supervisory responsibilities. And then for those of, um, you know, for those um, of you who are interested in government service, a, a 2016 uh, OPM study indicated that while Asian Americans were 9.8% of the federal professional workforce in 2016, they were only 4.4% of the workforce at the highest federal levels. So, and, you know, and, and the statistics go on and on. And so even though, you know, we are making strides and we're seeing reflected in positions of leadership, um, there's still much more work to be done, be done. And of course, you know, those numbers as well as um, the numbers with respect to the wage gap, you know, all continue to show, um, you know, the challenges ahead. So what does that mean for us? I mean, I, you know, I think that brings us nicely to uh, the topics that we are discussing today, which is the importance of mentorship and community engagement within the AAPI community. You know, what opportunities and barriers do we face? And you know, I will just say personally, um, you know, I had the opportunity to get to know Running Start um, when I joined the Asia Group. Um, but can I just say, I, I really wish that I had had such an organization when I was, um, you know, first. Uh, in high school, you know, trying to get into student government to college, um, where I uh, I tripped into student government, um, and and you know I've always been interested in policy and and public service. So, um, you know, it's it's organizations like Running Start, uh, which I know many of you um, have been able to see firsthand, that are so important, critical. And so we're fortunate that um, a couple of our member uh, panelists have actually um, are alumni, and, and I'll let them speak to that. So uh, enough from me. Um, let me turn it now uh, to our um, to our panelists. And what I thought would be uh, useful to start out is just to have um, the um, the panelists quickly introduce themselves, um, talk a little bit about their background, um, and you know, kind of what inspired them to 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 take. Um, you know, these steps. And then um, just as a reminder for um, participants that are joining us through Zoom, um, uh, I'll, I'll try to do this on Facebook as well, but I, I, that might, might be a little bit harder. But 
um, you know, we will um, we'll do some questions after the introductions, and then of course we'll open it up to all of you. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask of the panelists, um, you know, you can go down uh, in the Zoom app to the Q and A function and just go ahead and type in a question, and we'll make sure to present those. So with that, um, I'm just going to go ahead and start um, with, uh, at least on my screen, uh, Farah is above me. And so um, we'll have uh, Farah introduce herself first. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you to Running Start uh, for this lovely uh, opportunity to talk with the next generation. I'm very excited about it. My name is Farah Pandith. I am a former public servant. I was a political appointee in uh, both, both Bush Sr., uh, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama administrations. I say that to you because in 2020, there are very few people who understand the importance of uh, bipartisan, nonpartisan um, experience. And I was very fortunate to be able to serve the US Agency for International Development, the White House of the National Security Council, and at the State Department as a political appointee for all three presidents. Uh, and in my last role in the Obama administration, uh, I served under Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton during her entire term and for the first year of John Kerry's um, experience at the Secretary of State. I was the special representative to Muslim communities for the first time in American history. They established that position so that I could engage with Muslims around the world. Uh, that is my public sector experience. A couple of words on my private experience, which will connect us to the, the question at hand. Uh, I was not born in this country. I was born in Northern India in Kashmir and I came to the Boston area when I was a baby. Uh, very important to me uh, were two very important things. One is the way I was raised. My mother uh, is a physician, uh, she's retired now, but she worked for a county hospital. So this idea of community, this idea of giving back, this idea of this country, America, being your home was very much a part of who I was growing up. Uh, the second thing, like uh, some of the speakers before, uh, I was very, very active in both high school and in college in student government. Uh, I was co-class president every year uh, in high school. I was on the Senate in college, and then I was student body president when I was a senior at Smith. I say this to you because I cut my teeth on sort of community and engagement and learning how to listen. And the reason why that is important is because we cannot know, as a Congresswoman said, what is ahead. You don't know what opportunities are, are in front of you, but you can imagine anything, can't you? You can imagine the world. And I would urge us all, uh, even at this late age in my life, um, to, to not put barriers up of what it is you think you can do. And the second thing is, do not let anyone define who you are. You define who you are. Uh, and this category of Asian is so large and so complex that it makes people put you in silos. So I would just simply say, as we conclude in this, that um, the opportunities that were available to me to enter into public service is because I was very eager to serve a nation that I care very much about and because I knew who I was. Thanks so much, Farah. Um, Julie, do you wanna go next? Hi, yeah, thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm using Bluetooth for the first time. So um, that was very inspirational. And I just want to start off by saying thank you to Susanna, Melissa, and Sarah. It's actually so good to be back. Um, I was a 2014 Running Start Congressional Fellow, and I interned for Congressman Grace Meng back then. So it's really cool to be back in the space. Um, and just a little bit about me. I was raised in Queens, I'm actually in Bayside and Flushing in New York City. And I started off my career in public service by being a community organizer with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, and that was really when I first um, saw the power of community organizing and also became more confident about my own value because I was able to realize, actually, I do know my community best. And I am now an expert in trying to organize my own communities. And no one can really have that experience except those who were born there and raised there and really have gone through that system there. And so after my work at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, I was actually the first ever executive director of the Women's Caucus for the New York City Council. Um, it was the very first time that the Women's Caucus um, had a paid director. And so it was really a great experience to work with the 12 women in the New York City Council. And just as a caveat, there were only 11 when I started, and this is out of 51. So that just shows how 
um, how much more we can go in terms of gender representation in our own uh, local government. Um, and currently right now I work for the New York City Census 2020 under the mayor's office, making sure that all of our communities get counted. And on that note, I just wanted to end with asking everyone to fill out their census. If you haven't yet, uh, it's really important and it determines resources and representation for the next 10 years. Great, thank you so much, Julie. Uh, Misaki, do you wanna go next? Yes, so hi, my name is Misaki Collins. Um, so I wanna start just going a little bit backwards. Um, I was raised in Okinawa, Japan on a military base. And way before I even knew anything about politics, I remember seeing native Okinawan people protesting outside of the military base, you know, people who look like my mom. Um, so I think long before I knew anything about politics or international relations or anything like that, I knew that there was something called the government that was super important. Um, just like what Fair was saying, I was also very, very involved in student government, but never um, realized that I could run for political office until I got involved with Running Start. Um, I went through the high school program when I was 14 and have been involved ever since. Now I'm serving on the Planning and Zoning Commission for the city of Irving, which I love so much. Um, a lot of my work is just empowering women. I'm really, really interested in local politics, which um, a lot of Gen Z people don't, like that's not a sexy thing, right? Local politics is not, or planning, things like that is not um, interesting, but for anyone watching that's wanting to get more involved in local politics, you might not ever be on you know, the newspaper, you're not gonna get the clout that you would with other politics, but you were like, the work that you do is directly affecting people's lives. I think Masaki may have froze Getting there. Involved. Organizations like Running Star and Apex also has um, programs too that you can get involved in. But yeah, thank y'all so much for having me. Thanks so much, Masaki. Um, and Pearl? Sure, thank you uh, again for hosting. And uh, just a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Pearl Kim. Um, I was a former special victims prosecutor in the Special Victims Domestic Violence Division in Delaware County in Pennsylvania. I went on to become the chief of the human trafficking unit and what I was known for in Pennsylvania was uh, securing the first human trafficking conviction in the state. Um, I then ultimately was appointed to the executive office of the Pennsylvania Attorney General and I worked for uh, Democrat Josh Shapiro and I say that because I'm Republican. Um, so I too believe very strongly in um, being able to work across the aisle for the common good. And then in 2018, I had a very uh, unique opportunity where ultimately I ran for US Congress here in Pennsylvania. Uh, unfortunately, I did not win, um, but as a result of the campaign, I got very interested in immigration in particular. Uh, so I now practice immigration law. Great. Well, Pearl, thank you so much, and um, you know, looking forward to hearing more from from all of the panelists. Um, we just got, you know, kind of some really unique experiences and perspectives uh, to bring to bear. So, um, I thought maybe I'll start off the questions, um, and uh, maybe Julie, I can start with you and just um, ask you, you know, what what do you believe are the unique challenges and dynamics that's um, that are impacting AAPI women and girls' ability to lead. Yeah, thanks for the question. I want to first start off with something that uh, Farah said, another panelist, about how you know API and Asian Americans are not a monolith. So it's really hard to say really broadly um, the challenges and dynamics because Asian American really encompasses East, Southeast, South Asian, Pacific Islander, multi-ethnic, and diasporic Asian identities. Um, in addition to that, I think really thinking a lot about intersectionality has been really helpful with thinking about Kimberly Crenshaw's um, theory of intersectionality and how class and gender uh, plays a huge role in this. And so for me personally, uh, my parents were immigrants and I was born here, but you know I grew up low income and my parents had a fish market. And so that shaped, shaped my own worldview, like them having a small business and how that in, um, impacts myself. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that I've experienced as a challenge has been imposter syndrome. And I think one of the reasons for that has been because we don't see a lot of Asian American women in politics. And so 
for me, being with Running Start and being able to intern under Congressman Grace Meng and actually being in, you know, at, at Congress and like working there and kind of seeing myself there has helped me to realize, actually, I can see myself there. And so I think representation has been a really huge um, way that I was able to get over my imposter syndrome. Another thing that I would say is mentorship. And I think we all know that uh, mentorship is hard to get, especially in a field where there aren't a lot of mentors who are willing to mentor folks who they don't identify with. I think there was a study about how a lot of mentors choose people that they see themselves in. And so with Asian Americans, without having a lot of um, leaders that we can look up to, like finding a mentor uh, who has gone through or has a really illustrious career might be a little bit harder to find. But for me, what I found really helpful was the support of my peers and um, people who were around me that had similar values and visions as me to serve as my mentors. And I think having peer-to-peer -peer mentors are actually really helpful. And sorry about the traffic. I'm, I'm in New York City, so, you know, that's unavoidable. Great. Um, well, Julie, all, some really, really great points. Um, and, you know, I think um, quite a bit to unpack as we go forward, but um, I'll just say on the mentorship piece that, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I think Pearl and, and Farah can probably attest to this as well. I mean, whether in law or in government, the, you know, the, the areas that I've spent my professional career on, I've never really had a, a, a senior mentor, so to speak, that looked like me. Um, that just didn't exist at my big law firm, um, and it didn't exist uh, in government. But what I found were people who are willing to give me the opportunity, the same kind of opportunity that, you know, the person next door had, didn't matter what he or she looked like. Um, but as long as, you know, they were willing to, to take my, my abilities and support me, um, you know, that was enough to, to really kind of push me going forward. And so, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right in that respect. Um, you know, Misaki, maybe I could uh, turn to you next and ask, you know, you know, why do you think it's important that women support each other? I know this seems like a, a relatively, you know, basic question, but, um, you know, it, it's not always the case. So um, uh, from your experiences, you know, why do you think that's so critical? Yeah, so to put it as simple as possible, if women don't support each other, who will? I mean, you see men, um, they know that there's a pipeline, right? So they're getting their buddies on different boards and commissions and grooming them for political leadership. So I feel like women need to do the same. Um, and I think it's just as simple as that. And if people think that that's a bad thing to say, it's been happening for years. Like, you know, it's, it's not a secret. So I love seeing organizations that are intentionally focusing on women. Great, thank you so much. Um, Pearl, you know, you mentioned at the outset uh, during your introduction about, um, you know, running for for office. Um, that's um, that's a, a, a huge decision, and and I'm sure um, you know it was a, a very impactful one for you. Um, I know there are quite a few folks that are joining us today who you know want to likewise um, you know pursue elected a, a, an elected position at some point. So maybe you could give us a little bit of a sense as to you know what motivated you to to run. And um, you know, kind of where 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 do you think you'll be headed next? Um, yeah, so my decision to run was actually very personal, um, and it was uh, fairly difficult to share initially on the campaign because I did recognize that I was sharing it uh, kind of on a national stage. Uh, but ultimately, I was a victim of a campus sexual assault when I was in college, um, and I ended up going through the criminal justice system as a victim. And I did not get the justice that I was seeking and I was very displeased with my prosecutor. So that um, after that incident, I decided that I was going to go on and become a special victims prosecutor. Um, so I served as an SVU prosecutor for a decade. I loved every single day of it. Um, and I actually frankly thought I was going to probably do that for the rest of my life, but I had got involved with um, legislation while I was in the DA's office. Uh, working on human trafficking legislation um, and other types of legislation. And um, while I was in the DA, DA's office, I ended up actually um, battling cancer. And after um, I battled cancer, you know, it really kind of also shifted my perspective again with this realization that, my God, life is so short um, and I need to do more. 
And that is why I ultimately ended up going to the Attorney General's office and working on the campus safety initiative across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I had this unique opportunity to run for US Congress. Now this is 2018. So there were a lot of different things that were brewing at this time. Uh, number one was the Me Too movement was happening. And you were starting to see this level of accountability in various institutions and top executives resigning and so forth. And um, it was extremely unfortunate, but in Pennsylvania, we had a lot of Me Too related scandals. So my uh, Democratic Township Commissioner gets uh, arrested for the possession of child pornography. My Democratic State Senator gets into a Me Too related scandal. Then my Republican Congressman suddenly resigns from a Me Too related scandal. And so this was crossing both sides of the aisle. Uh, I was extremely frustrated um, with our uh, elected officials. I was um, being the daughter of immigrants. I was very frustrated with the national rhetoric towards immigrants. Uh, and I decided that uh, I was gonna run for office. And so I was a, a new time candidate, um, very little political experience prior to that. Uh, I resigned from the attorney general's office. I uh, got my life savings together. Um, and then I started gunning for the endorsement. And uh, ultimately I got the endorsement. And like I said, uh, I ended up running and it was a unique time. I had to actually run in two congressional districts uh, at the same time, which is a whole nother story. Uh, but in any case, um, I was uh, very deeply inspired by my own personal journey. Um, and uh, like I said, it uh, presented a lot of challenges along the way. I mean, I just I remember calling my mom saying, uh, Mom, I, um, I shared my story. And she's like, what? And, and uh, you know, being Asian American and I think discussing being a victim of sexual violence and even talking about, you know, being a cancer survivor. And she's like, with who? I said, um, with the Washington Post. She's like, don't tell your dad. It's okay. Don't tell your dad. He doesn't watch the Washington Post. And so, you know, there were some uh, cultural things that I was dealing with as well on the campaign, but uh, certainly um, it was well worth the experience. Great. Pearl, um, maybe I could just ask you a quick follow up, um, which is that, sure. um, uh, it, um, you know, it, it was such a, um, are you thinking about running again? Would you, would you run again? Would you recommend the, you know, the experience to, to others? I would absolutely recommend the experience to others. I think, um, you know, part of the concern that I've always had was that uh, we don't have um, Asian Americans are so underrepresented in politics and government, and it's critically important. And I've been saying this for so long. And so, of course, my lawyer friends were like, then maybe you should run, <laughs> which is sort of also how the first seed got planted. And I think that seed always has to kind of be there. And um, I'm, I'm grateful for APACs and other programs that I had done prior to running that kind of gave me a little bit exposure to politics because I think the same thing as you had said, just finding mentors, um, you know, as an attorney and let alone in the political field was extremely challenging. And so I think it's critical. Now, in terms of me running again, I don't know. Uh, I am very flattered that after the campaign, I have been asked to run for a slew of seats. Um, but at this time, I don't have any immediate uh, plans to run in the near future. <laughs> Got it. Thanks so much, Pearl. Um, well, Farah, um, you know, um, I thought, you know, uh, given your experience, um, both in the public sector and, and private, um, you know, how, how you know, and, and, and the positions you've had, I mean, you know, what are you personally doing to supporting women and girls um, so that they are able to, you know, to take on these leadership positions um, at some point in the future? Such an important question for us all, isn't it, Sharon? And I appreciate you asking it. Um, there are a couple of things. First is something I, I was feel very proud that I was part of when I was in government. Um, I had been around that policy table so often as the only woman that I had gotten to a place where I was going insane uh, as somebody who, um, you know, had not really absorbed it the way I had. I remember there was a moment in the Bush administration where I was in the sit room at the White House. And for those of you who don't know my background, what I worked on in government post 9-11 was extremism, is extremism. That's what I, I work on. I, 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 that's my field. So we are at a meeting about Al Qaeda and we're in the sit room. It's really small. Um, I talk with my hands, as you can see. I remember I was in this room. I, I moved my hand in one direction and I happened to look past my hand 
And I suddenly, it just suddenly realized that there were no other women in the room. And I was looking at uniform after uniform from the military. I was looking at my former call, I mean, colleagues, they were all men, all great, really smart, all super. I just remember looking around that room and I just became crazy. I, I got really, really hot and I got really, really angry, finished the meeting. And I remember walking from the, from the, the sit room across the little way to the old executive office building with a colleague of mine who was a very senior guy. And I said to him, what the heck? There were no women around the policy table. What is up with that? And I was angry and I said, this is ridiculous. This is one of the biggest threats our nation has ever felt. You know, terrorist organizations are in here. We have to have a whole slew of different kinds of solutions, not just hard power solutions, but soft power solutions too. You need diverse voices. This is insane. And he just turned to me and he said, so do something about it. And I was like, well, obviously, right. Do something about it. You know, it was sort of a light bulb in my head. Obviously I'd been doing that my whole life, why wouldn't I do that now? It wasn't the right moment, but what was the right moment was when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State. And I walked into Anne Marie Slaughter's office at the Department of State. And I said, Anne Marie, I have a really crazy idea and I don't know if the Secretary is gonna like it, but here it is. We've gotta do more to get young women around the policy table, not just the politics table, the policy table. I want them in the civil service. I want them in the foreign service. I want them in the rooms where policy is being made, not just on Capitol Hill, as much as I respect it, but in this branch of government too. Do you think the secretary is gonna like the idea? She's like, are you kidding me? So we worked very closely with um, Milan Verveer, obviously, created something called the Women in Public Service Project, which Hillary Clinton launched in 2011. So that's something I did inside government. Outside of government, and I've been doing this my whole life, um, is you've got to do two very important things. One is tell your story. I think speaking up, speaking about the things that are good, bad, and ugly that, have exper that you've experienced and not being shy about it, Pearl, I was so moved by what you said, um, what courage to say it to us, but courage to say it to the world. We have got to be able to speak truth to power, what we've experienced, what people say things. For me, you know, this issue of identity is really important. For those of you who don't know much about South Asia, my name is really confusing to people. They don't get it. They don't understand why I have an Arabic first name and a Sanskrit last name. And wait a minute, she's the Muslim woman, but she has a Hindu last name. Like who could she possibly be? And all of those identities have resulted in a whole host of things that have happened across the way in government service and outside of government service. So to be able to tell those stories accurately to young women who are eager and interested on your own thing. And then, and then the final thing is, in the thing that I've learned is you don't have to be at the largest podium um, with the biggest stage to make a difference to young women. And so by being able to talk to my students and others, even one-on-one, -on -one, um, you can inspire them, you can motivate them, you can move them in a particular direction, and I do that every day of the week. So um, for me, it's a, it's a multitude of different things, Sharon, but those are some, those are some examples. Great, Wolfar. Um, that's incredibly helpful, and I think all really good points. Um, so we, you know, we've gotten quite a few questions. So I, I'm tempted to make sure I want to make sure we try to address as many of these as possible. So I'm going to turn to to those first. Um, and so I'm just going to open up to the panelists. Feel free, you know, one if not all of you to 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 jump in and and um, and give us your thoughts. Um, but so the first thing is, you know, um, someone from um, who's listening in or participating from Facebook, which is uh, from Angela, how do you deal with lack of fairness and justice in workplaces, especially with respect to the old boys club? So um, I think Farah, you might have, uh, uh, Farah, you might have talked about the old boys club first. So maybe well, I'll ask you to it, start. It's a, it's a robust and really active uh, club. Um, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of connections, and it hasn't diminished. Um, that's the big headline. I don't care how many movements and marches, it has not diminished. Um, so um, there are there are many examples in my life where I look back now and I realize what happened. I was too naive at the time to know that it was because I was female or because I happened to be the person um, that they thought I was at a particular, you know, whatever it was that I didn't get that thing or I didn't fit into that silo or that bucket or that box. But today, 
what you do is you don't have to be nasty about it, but you need to make the point. And I've learned how to make that point. I know who to go to. I know how to say it with a smile on my face. And I know how to press the pr pressure points so that so that action is taken. Um, and I, it took me some time. So what I'd say to, I don't know how old the, the, the person is who's asking this question, but if you were early in your career and you don't feel comfortable being able to do that, and I get all of that, find an ally who can work with you uh, on making sure that, that, that the things that you're noticing uh, are raised. Great, thanks for um, Would any of our other panelists like to uh, jump in with their thoughts? I can jump in quickly. I think one thing that I've really taken a lot of strength from is having a group of women around me. And uh, one of the, one of the organizations that I've co-founded is the Asian American Feminist Collective, where we think about feminism and we think about feminist politics. Um, but also organizing. You know, I think we sometimes think we're the only place that we can make changes in the workplace, but. I would encourage you to find people who have the same values and who want to work on something with you and organize outside of work. Um, organize on issues that you care about outside of work because ultimately that for me has actually led to see more opportunities and more change that I could see directly and, I, and that I could also control more directly as well. Great, thanks so much, Julie. Really, really fast. Um, so in the workplace, this is something I had to learn the hard way. I learned this last year with my first ever job. I loved it, but there was definitely a lack of fairness and just justice. Um, instead of having that seat at the table and just trying to bring other people to that table, remember that if that's a toxic workplace, bringing more people is just gonna bring them into a toxic workplace, right? It's not just gonna change overnight. And instead of bringing people into a toxic workplace, you can always move to another workplace. That's what I had to do or just build your own. Um, but yeah, that's, people think just bringing more people of color or more women is gonna help. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and that's a hard pill to swallow, but that's something to remember because being in those places and bringing other people in can be just emotionally exhausting. Um, no, and it's it's a very good point, Misaki. And, um, and it actually, um, uh, dovetails into another question that we've received, um, which is, um, you know, obviously there's gonna be instances, unfortunately, where, um, you know, you might not be able to, um, to kind of bring about the change from within. But um, what we're likely to see oftentimes at a minimum though is pushback, um, you know, as you're trying to pursue um, changes in, in your workplace. And so the question is, you know, how, how, how should you approach that pushback? Um, uh, what what are some of the you know steps that you've taken or approaches that you've taken? Anyone? Um, I'm sorry. Pushback in the workplace or just generally speaking? Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, the question is related to um, you know uh, pushback um, as you're trying to make positive changes in your place of work from your supervisor. I was thinking more just kind of an example uh, from the campaign in the sense that um, I think it is important for people to recognize that um, trying to get the endorsement, the endorsement by no means was handed to me. And so I got a lot of pushback um, from just uh, the, the Republican party in terms of being a new face uh, trying to enter the field. And so, um, you know, I uh, wasn't taking no for an answer and I let them know that. <laughs> and I think that that was part of it. And um, I had to do uh, some very serious measures to get their attention, which was um, leaving my appointment in the executive office at the AG's office. Uh, then explaining to them that I was putting pretty much my life savings uh, into this race. And so anyway, I just, it, it's kind of uh, that notion too of, having to kind of break into the all boys network. Um, and I, I recognize that the opportunity was there, but um, certainly uh, it, it wasn't easy. And I'd have to say it, it was a little bit of a lonely road. Um, but once I got there, um, I do give the party credit. They were tremendous in supporting me once I did receive the endorsement, so. Great, thanks so much. 
Um, so another question that we've received um, relates to um, this person works on a campaign uh, and is finding it difficult to, to find their space and, and voice their opinions as the only Asian woman and uh, one of the only POC on staff. And so, um, you know, she gets caught up in feeling like the token POC. So in times like that, she wished she had an Asian woman um, that, you know, like herself uh, in leadership that she could talk to. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that we probably all felt like that and or been in a similar situation in, in one respect or another. So her question is um, any advice for us for someone like her? Whoever that is, please find me on Facebook. <laughs> and even though there's no one in the campaign working with you, there are so many people who feel just like you and understand how just terrible and you know draining that can be. So find those people. I would love to talk to you because I feel you <laughs> so much. Um, and good, good. That's a great thing, you know, being in a system or part of an organization and feeling like you're infiltrating it. Like that's very exciting because you feel like you're bringing change, but it's exhausting. I know. <laughs> so yeah, whoever that is, please. Like I would love to talk to you. And you know, um, I'll just add. Um, take a, the prerogative for a second, um, which is that, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, um, Asian women in particular do face this kind of double challenge. Um, you know, uh, I, ironically, um, you know, we're, we're typically educated. Um, and so there is that expectation um, of competence and, and usually we more than deliver. Um, but then at the same time, um, there is also this, you know, kind of perception that, um, you know, that you, you shouldn't be very vocal. Um, and so, but then if you aren't very vocal and you're studying the situation, then you're perceived as being, you know, kind of soft and meek and submissive. But if you speak up, then you're aggressive. You've got sharp elbows and, you know, all words that, you know, if it were to describe your male counterpart would be, you know, worth a pat on the back. Um, but for Asian women in particular, you've got that, um, that double challenge that you have to, to, to navigate. And it's really um, quite quite difficult. And so um, I, I think Masaki is right, you know, um, maybe that person isn't going, you know, there is no person that's going to look like you, but there may be another woman that may feel the same way, or there may be, you know, someone who, who will be able to relate to you um, and, or, or just be able to support you. And, um, and, and I will say this, you know, um, you know, take it from our male counterparts, you're never going to get that support unless you ask for it. And um, I, I am, you know, the biggest offender of that. And, you know, maybe it's my background, but it's like, oh, you know, I, you know, I, I shouldn't ask for support. And, and if I'm doing well, if I'm, if I'm smart and I'm doing the work, then I should, you know, I should be recognized for that. But that's just not always how it works. And so um, oftentimes, you know, you just, you just kind of have to put yourself out there. And sometimes it's not going to work, but sometimes it will. So just a, a little bit of food for thought. Um, a few few more questions that we've gotten. Um, so uh, how do your experiences as an AAPI woman shape your decisions in your career today? I'm not sure I would answer it in terms of shaping my decisions in my career, um, but I'm very conscious of the fact that diversity matters um, and that the more responsibility you have to have a uh, have an opportunity to talk about uh, a wide set of issues it's I think really um, I take on the responsibility also I feel it inside of me to make sure I'm not describing something as a monolith and really poking when it's it when, when I can uh, to make an audience or a class or fellow policymakers understand the the importance of that diversity around us I mean you talked about Sharon two particular glass ceilings that we are dealing with one is the gender um, component. One is um, a regional component. Um, I would also say there's a religious component and an ethnic component. Um, and there are a multitude because this part of the world is, is ancient. And so there are many, many, many different forces that are moving into identity. And I think for the vast majority of people that we run into in our work life, um, they don't see that. So it, it, it is, uh, I, take great, I take great care with the way I pick words 
I take great care with the way I describe things, even if it takes me longer to do so, to make sure that everybody feels included. Um, I used to drive people crazy when I was at the State Department that I would, uh, I would reject the terminology Muslim world because I don't even know what that means. Um, and I would say Muslim communities around the world, um, specifically to say that a Muslim in Malaysia is as Muslim as a Muslim living in Detroit. So cut it out, you know, we're not building a hierarchy. And I do the same thing when I talk about, um, uh, you know, other parts of the world. So I think it's an important question. And I think one of the things that, um, that I take from, from the question also is that there, and, and also the questioner before, I think Misaki said, Misaki said it, it, there's a lot of burden on you, right? <laughs> there, these, are, these are things that you carry with you that a lot of people do not. But I take it with a positive thing as opposed to a negative thing. Aren't I lucky to have an opportunity to define this as opposed to somebody else who doesn't have the background I do so that I can explain it in the way I think it should be explained? Yeah, and just to jump in there, I think that, you know, obviously my entire life and worldview is shaped by how I move through the world as an Asian American woman, as a Korean American woman. And I think for me being in politics, I don't necessarily try to buy into the existing model. I think that the what I've learned in politics is that actually there can be another way to do things. Like we actually can have a pol you know, politics and um, politicians that have, you know, a different mindset, um, have like a, you know, thinking about like being a woman, like childcare, like, you know, universal childcare, like having all of those different um, ideas that someone who isn't Asian and someone who isn't a woman can have, I try to bring that to the table and I try to be unapologetic about that. Great. Thanks so much, Julie and Farah. Um, so another question is relates to, you know, what advice would you give to AAPI women who are college students that are hoping to pursue a career in government? And obviously we've had both federal and, and uh, state and local represented on the panel. So would love to hear um, your thoughts on that. Uh, I can jump in to say we are coming into an election year. I mean, and at least in New York City next year, 35 out of the 51 city council members will be term limited. So there's going to be campaigns galore. Um, I feel like everyone and their mom is going to be running for office next year. I would get plugged in, find someone that you identify with, some, find someone you believe in and has um, the politics that you know you identify with and help out on a campaign. I think that was one of the fastest way to get to know a lot of people and also quickly build up my leadership skills. Well, um, we are, um, sorry, I just got the notice that we are quickly running out of time and I apologize um, because there's still so many questions um, that we've received, but um, maybe let me just quickly before I turn it back to Suzanne and Madeline to close out for us, um, do any of the panelists uh, have any um, kind of final concluding thoughts or points that they'd like to make uh, before I turn it over? Well, um, let me just say then, um, you know, thanks to, to, to each and every one of you for, um, for your participation today. Um, you've kind of provided some very interesting insights and, um, and a, a very diverse set of perspectives, which I think is wonderful and, and only goes to show, you know, kind of what we are, um, you know, kind of um, what we are. So I think with that, let me then uh, thank the panelists again and, and turn it to Susanna and Madeline for some closing remarks. Sharon, thank you so much. I, I always think an hour seems like a long time for a panel and this went way too short. Um, there were so many questions that didn't get answered. And for anybody who didn't get your question answered, um, just you know, put it into the Facebook uh, page and we will try and, and get those questions answered for you. But Sharon, thank you very much for being such a wonderful moderator and to Farah and Julie and Pearl uh, and Misaki. Thank you all very much for being with us today and giving us such great insight. Um, and Tasha Cole, thank you for giving us introductory remarks. And Madeline, it's been such a pleasure to partner with you. We've actually, Running Start and APACs have never partnered uh, together before. So it was really wonderful to be able to share this, uh, this hour with you. So Madeline, I will hand it to you for closing remarks. Well, thank you so much, Susanna, and, and to all the panelists and uh, to Sharon for moderating and um, her remarks also from 
KPAC Chair Congresswoman Judy Chu. Uh, this kind of conversation is always needed. Uh, we are happy to be partnering with uh, Running Start on uh, this panel. We hope to work with you more as we continue navigating the space of increasing diversity and inclusion, and especially at representation. Uh, I put some items in the chat box for those people who were um, on the webinar, um, and I'm happy to share them also um, on your Facebook page. Um, but as I mentioned in the chat, APEX, um, we've been around since 1994. We were started by former Secretary Norman Netta when he was a member of Congress and uh, he co-founded KPAC, of which Judy Chu is now chair. And so our mission is to increase AAPI representation. And so we have these lovely programs where high school students, college students come on the Hill to learn more about the legislative process. And so for a lot of the questions I saw, please turn to APACS as a resource. We build a great network of alumni. We have elected officials who've gone through our programs. NBC News did a story on us talking about how we are the organization that brings city council members to Congress. And so we have a tr proven track record of helping APIs get elected. And so um, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with you more about the programs that we provide. I look forward to seeing you all on the campaign trail at one point or supporting an AAPI woman who's looking to run for office in the future. So thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.